Hey guys, this is Jonathan. I'm back for the third installment of my Zurich 1953 uh, video series. So uh, this game, we get a, a matchup between Max Yu and Alexander Kotov. Um, so let's get into it. So after after d4 from uh, from Max Yu, uh, we get knight f6, c4, c5, and we're already in a in a Benoni type system. So at d5, e6, immediately challenging the center there. Knight c3, e takes d, and pretty normal move so far. And uh, this is the first move that to me is uh, sort of new, or, or not really new, but um, not something I really know a lot about, and I found this pretty interesting. So I think a, a more normal way of developing the, the bishop, rather than going to g2, is to play e4, uh, g7, h3 to prevent uh, the bishop from coming to g4, castle, and then putting the bishop on d3. And I think this is uh, more normal, or putting it to e2. Um, but in my own games against the Benoni, I've uh, I've always sort of struggled with a less white squared bishop. I think I've tried it about everywhere, ranging from b uh, from b5 all the way to to e2. And I've never really looked at these Fianchetto systems, so I think this will be a treat for us. Um, so after g3, we get the <clears throat> logical play from both sides. Black is still playing just standard development. He's going to get the, his queen side action going here. So the, the black trumps are, um, he has quite a few in this position, actually. He's got a queen side, three versus two, which could be good, meaning because it could produce a pass pawn. Uh, we've got, he's got the open E file here for his rooks and uh, can potentially uh, attack against this E pawn at some point. He also has good bishops for his diagonal. Um, so I, I think that uh, there's a lot to be said for, for black setup here. Um, so after a6, it's pretty clear he's planning to play b5, so white puts a clamp on that. So um, what's white going on in this position? So in, normally the, the plans that I'm really aware of are based around playing e4, e5, or sometimes f4, f5. Um, but in this game, uh, you picks a, a plan where he's actually going to play on the queen side, uh, which is, again, not something I've really seen before, and I found it really, really pretty interesting. I think that perhaps uh, the reason for this is that um, <clears throat> the bishop is on g2, pointing towards the queen side, rather than on d3, uh, pointing towards the king side. Um, I think that that may be a reason for it. So white is probably going to be playing moves like knight e2 and into c4, and then hitting against the weak, the weak square on on d6. Um, it also sort of makes sense playing on the queen side because he's got this pawn at d5, which means he has more space on the on the queen side. Um, so anyway, we sort of continue development on. We get d2. He's headed to c4 here. Rook e8 just opening. To the to the main line so a5 here this really clamps down and means that he can never um, play b5 and sort of establish a pawn there because uh, white will always be able to take on passant so he goes ahead and play d5 we got passant and knight b6 <clears throat> okay so after he played b5 he actually um weakens the 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 c6 and the a5 square um and since this knight here uh, is covering c4, which white would like to play knight c4, he, he goes in and attacks these other, uh, or utilizes these other queen side weaknesses. He plays knight b3, so is, he's uh, sort of eyeing ultimately the c6 square here. <clears throat> so uh, after queen c7, uh, we just get knight a5 already, and bishop d7, letting him know that he's not going not gonna to get away with that, at least not immediately anyway. H3, so this kind of prevents uh, one of the main maneuvers that Black is going to try, which would be playing knight g4 and then into e5. So uh, it prevents that. And the other way of getting there would be um, going this way, but the bishop's currently in the way. So this is going to cost him a little bit of time if he wants to execute that plan. Uh, so he plays bishop b5, perhaps preparing it. He also uh, may be preparing to play to play c4. Uh, although I'm not sure that the c4 plan is quite as effective right now, anyway, because the pawn still being on e2 um, covers this d3. So black may be playing something like knight. He could be playing something like knight to d7 and then playing c4 
and playing knight c5 and then trying to hop into d3, which is a lot of times this d3 square can be a big problem in the Benoni. And so maybe that's one advantage of holding back this e pawn is that d3 is not going to be a problem. So instead, he's probably going to play, he would play something like bishop or knight to d7 and then out to e5 and perhaps heading to c4 instead. Um, so we get e3 because we had a threat on e2. And this just cuts it off and develops the uh, the bishop to an active square pointed towards the queen side. So uh, and making it evidently clear that uh, he's not planning e4, e5 plans anytime soon. So black just continues on with his with his plan. But then uh, <clears throat> U plays a good move. He plays queen b3, which prevents him from being able to to execute his plans that he either of the plans that I mentioned above. So, um, for for example, um, if we get c4, um, then after knight b6, uh, <clears throat> excuse me. So after yeah, after c4, sorry, <laughs> we get uh, just knight takes, which is uh, hitting the queen, and then also this fork here. So after a takes, then just queen takes, and uh, and this is not not what uh, not what Black was hoping for. He's got uh, he can't play knight into c5 now uh, because the bishop would hang on b6. So the this is quite quite problematic for him. If he plays knight e5 instead, uh, then then White can can pick up a pawn. And um, and again, this is not really what. Uh, what what uh, Kotov was was hoping for, um, so in, and it's also I, I need to note that he can't uh, um, he can't win the pawn here on e2 because after bishop takes c3, um, queen takes and then and then uh, bishop takes the pawn he's up a pawn, uh, but his dark squares are going to be just awful. So after something like bishop b5. Uh, bishop h6, he has to play f6 to cover that, and we get rook e6, and uh, the rook cannot be taken. So um, it's kind of quite interesting. He takes the, if he takes, then we get dx e6, and uh, we've opened up this attack this way, and we're hitting the knight at the same time, and he can't meet both of those threats. Uh, even if the rook wasn't hanging here, um, the knight would have to move and uh, f6 would lose its defender. Um, so none of those are possible. Uh, Bronstein actually recommends uh, that black play here, um, rook a, b8. And he says that now, um, after knight x, b5, uh, a takes knight c6, rook b7, uh, queen takes b4 is impossible because of knight takes d5. Um, <clears throat> so I think that... Uh, this may have been may have been a better way to go, but actually the the plan that Kotov uh, executes here uh, after Queen B3 is Knight Knight F6 is quite quite an interesting quite an interesting idea. So we get to Rook F C1, which is preparing to play this B4 break, which is kind of given where all of his pieces are on the Queen side, makes sense that he's going to follow up with this Queen side break. Um, so after um, bishop d7, so that uh, he's no longer going to win a pawn here. Um, <clears throat> he plays queen d1 to, to further prep this uh, b4 move. And uh, let's just give, if we just give um, black sort of a null move, you can really see the, the power of this b4 idea. So if he just plays something like king h8, something, uh, a non-move, and we get b4, there's a lot of problems. Um, Black can't just take it because then we get knight a4 and uh, the discovery on the queen and the double attack is going to drop drop a knight. Um, so after, he, he doesn't really want to play c4 because again, bishop takes the knight and the queen takes and then we get knight takes c4 and uh, after queen takes, um, he's he's having some, some real difficulties over here on the, on the queen side. D6 is going to be a problem. After it's probably knight a2, um, he's just uh, he's just sort of getting overrun on, on the queen side. And white's pieces are pretty active. So I don't think he wants to go for that. 
Um, his last option maybe would be just to like to back up the the pawn and then try to move the queen away from away from the defender. But this is this fails just to bishop takes or sorry, b takes c5, d takes, and then d6, uh, and uh, all kinds of problems here now. This pawn is super powerful and uh, it's it's this is quite quite bad. So instead of suffering through uh, a b4 move um, after queen d1, uh, Kotov comes up with a really interesting idea to complicate matters, and he plays this exchange sacrifice on e3, which is a really, really interesting idea. Um, <clears throat> so, of course, of course, uh, white is uh, obliged to take it, and he gets bishop h6, hitting the pawn. And uh, this pawn is pinned, so he's probably going to he's gonna be able to pick up this pawn. So he's going to have a pawn for the exchange, um, plus some other some other weak squares around the king, and he'll definitely have the have an initiative. So queen d3 defending the pawn, and rook comes out to to further attack it, and then he plays king h2, uh, which so that the when if bishop takes, it's not going to come with check, and it sort of has the the added bonus that he's protecting this undefended pawn here. So get rook takes, and then he comes out and grabs his pawn here. Um, <clears throat> we get uh, rook e5, which is gunning after this d pawn. Um, but it actually turns out that the d pawn is untouchable. There's some really interesting tactics here. So after rook f1, um, it's it's nice because it's impossible to play um, knight takes, knight takes, knight takes, bishop takes. Rook takes, and this looks like it would be good, like he's uh, like uh, up a piece. But at the very, very end, we have this check on a8, and uh, and White's just going to be a, um, just going to be up too much material here, and uh, there'll be no more no more play. H7 could become a problem, uh, so this this obviously wouldn't wouldn't work. <clears throat> instead, um, instead he he realizes this and plays Queen out to. Uh, Excuse me. He plays bishop back to c8, which is met by queen b5. We get bishop d7, and then knight c6, which is attacking the the rook here. He's got to do something about that. Um, please, so, but he, he he ignores it because uh, there is this pin here, of course, um, and he still can't take the pawn. Uh, excuse me. He plays king g7 because he still can't take the pawn on on d5. So if knight takes knight takes knight, bishop, rook, we have a check on, on d7 here, which the the uncovering of the bishop versus the queen doesn't matter because after king moves, rook takes, uh, we're hitting the queen as well. So this would be an even worse situation of trying to win the d pawn as before. So he plays king g7, hoping to, to circumvent that. Um, but then we get the, the rook coming in, and he's threatening to, to win this uh, win the knight here. So we get knight c8 to try to prevent that, and then queen b8. So just a, um, a, a queen exchange, but it's going to leave white's pieces really active on the queen side. So queen takes, knight takes, and uh, he's got some some issues with, uh, with the bishop here. He doesn't want to drop any more pieces, or exchange any more pieces, rather. The threat, of course, right now is just rook takes f6, followed by knight takes on, on <clears throat> excuse me, on C on D7, which would be a not just winning two pieces for the for the rook, but also would get an exchange on top of that at the end. So bishop F5, you get rook C6 attacking the knight here. So now the threat is just rook takes F5, and then uh, rook takes C8. So E8, which uh, rook E8 defending that, and uh, it's <laughs> it's I found this amusing that now after all this on move 32. Um, Max U plays the the e4 bishop d7, and then follows up with e5, which is a really nice move, uh, because of course if bishop takes, then we get pawn takes with check, and then king will play back say f8, and and then we get the the pawn takes, and this pawn is going to be incredibly strong, um, <clears throat> so that's of course impossible. So after um, he just takes the rook with, or takes the pawn with his rook instead. And we get knight takes d7, uh, rook takes, and then he he drops this knight, and he's down 
not in exchange any longer, but a full rook. So we get rook e3, which this is really just sort of desperation here. Um, <clears throat> he's just going to, white's just going to come in, take the d6 pawn, and then he's just going to have this pass pawn. He's going to shove down the board. So rook takes, and then he gets the rook behind the pawn. This is really a moot point because he can kick him. Of course, black doesn't want to exchange because any exchanges are just going to make whites win even simpler. So uh, white just bullies him out of the, off the D file. And then uh, a nice, a nice finish, rook c6. And um, either he takes it or he doesn't. It doesn't much matter. This pawn's going to come, come crashing down. So after queen takes, just going to take it, um, maybe rook e8. Um, again, it's, this is it's a c7, and um, and it's it's going to be over very soon. So say rook blocks that, um, just knight b5 defending the pawn, and then we're going to get bishop coming down to d7 on the next move, and uh, it's going to be all over from there. So um, here, Kotov threw in the towel. So this is quite quite a nice um, quite a nice game, and. Uh, uh, I think it showed an interesting plan from, from White's point of view um, with this queenside piece play in the, in the Benoni, not something that I've been that familiar with. And then we also have to commend Kotov for going for this really interesting um, exchange sacrifice in the center and getting some play. Although it didn't pan out for him, it was still, uh, it was still a nice attempt. So uh, I hope you guys enjoyed this game, and uh, we'll see, uh, see you next time when I uh, bring out the next one. Thanks a lot, guys.